Hi. I'm going to talk to you today about rubber recycling. Now, uh, to make things a little simpler, um, can you put up your hands if any of you have bought new tires in the last two years? If you've changed your tires in the last two years? Cool. Now, keep your hands up if you know what happened to those tires, if you know how they were recycled, where they went. Almost no one, okay. Now, this is actually common. This is representative of the actual problem globally. Rubber recycling, uh, in its real sense, is a difficult challenge. It's not easy. And because of that, we have a problem. Before we get into that, let me take you through a little bit of history. About 160 years ago, a gentleman by the name of Charles Good uh, Goodyear uh, was working very hard at the material of his age, and that was rubber. At the time, the best that they could do was to use it to uh, weatherproof fabric, and not very well at that. It became brittle in the cold, it was uh, uh, tacky, and it rotted out in the heat. It, it just couldn't be used. So he was working on methods to industrialize the material. And whether by accident or by plan, he uh, mixed sulfur and it was heated up over a period of time. And he discovered that the material transformed. It suddenly had properties. It had tensile, it had resilience. He discovered vulcanization. The sulfur formed crosslinks, and those crosslinks allowed for those properties. It was like a network that supported itself. And it became uh, one of those things where you know, it became indestructible. In fact, vulcanization in the chemistry textbooks was referred to as uh, uh, irreversible. Now, I'm not going to bore you with, with uh, chemistry at this point in time, but to give you an analogy that will make sense, it's like baking a cake. Uh, in the case of a cake, you take uh, your ingredients, your milk, sugar, flour, and whatnot, you mix them all up, and you get a batter, you heat it up, and you get a cake, a transformation. In the case of tires, for instance, you take your natural rubber, synthetic rubber, chemicals, sulfur, carbon black, mix it all up, heat it up, and you've got your tire. <laughs> yeah? Now, this is where vulcanization comes into play. Now, the problem is, you can't put your cake back into your batter. You can't make cake with cake. The same problem is there with tires. Vulcanized crap, you could grind it up into powder, you could cook it to death, and then try to put it in a gunge, but you couldn't put it back in as the original material. It's a huge challenge. This indestructibility was an issue. Now, add to that the scope of the issue. You put it into the ground, it's so powerful that you come back 50, 100 years from now, and it's still a tire. Long after the, the vehicle that you'd uh, mounted the tires on have disintegrated and disappeared, the damn thing is still a tire. <laughs> yeah. So what do you do? Then you add to it, you know, the, the population globally. The reality is with, you know, you have to talk about the numbers. Today, in the developed nations around the world, the formula is one waste scrap tire for every person man, woman, or child. Now, if you look at it in terms of the new context of India and China coming into play, can you imagine when you start talking about one tire for every man, woman, or child on the planet? That's where we're going. Now, understand, in the past, there have been ways of dealing with the problem. You put them in the tire dumps, and you had mountains of them all over the place. Some of them got very, very big. This turned out to be a problem. It was a bit of a mistake, actually a big problem, right? Uh, this wasn't very long ago. This was two years ago. It's a bit hard to accept, isn't it? Now, responsible governments around the world and companies decided that something had to be done. So they started controlling this landfills and tire dumps, because really you don't want this next door. 
those fumes are toxic. They will end you. They started controlling the way in which this was done. And today, for want of a solution, for want of an alternative, you burn them as a substitute for charcoal. 50% of the scrap tires around the world are burnt as a substitute for charcoal. Not exactly recycling, right? And certainly not sustainable. But this is all they had. The rest of it goes into your roads, goes into uh, athletic fields and uh, sports surfaces, and then you have niche applications that uh, you know utilize it in, as a filler in manufacturing. So here we are. This is a huge problem, and this is where I came into the picture. I mean, I'd spent nearly 10 years looking at existing solutions and realizing that, you know, while it was nice, some people could make money, there was no link between uh, the generation of scrap and what you were going to do with it, other than burning it all and, and messing up the world. And, you know, everybody wants to have made a difference. And I really wanted to make a difference somehow, you know, because it's not, not just my children, it's your children, it's all of them, it's their future. And you put this stuff up there, we're going to have to live with it. So I spent more than 10 years trying to look for a solution. And this solution had to be total. I mean, it, it became clear. It was, you know, go big or go home. It had to be a solution that addressed the, the accumulation, the, the generation of the scrap globally, not just in one location. So it had to be volume-based, scalable, modular, and it, it had to be low energy. It had to have a very low energy footprint. That, you know, basically it made no sense to consume enormous amounts of energy just to get rid of this scrap. And you needed to make sure it was non-toxic and no pollution. That means no byproducts. It was difficult. There were many challenges and made a lot of mistakes. I learned that sustainability and green, nice to talk about, but if it didn't make money, no one was interested. You know, they'd hold your hand and dance with you for a little while, and then they'd walk away. So making the whole process commercially viable was as critical. I've got to tell you, we did it. Here in Malaysia. In 2010, we produced the first, first anywhere, commercial vehicle tire, light truck tire, that had devulcanized contents into a light truck tire. We produced the tire, we ran them on the highways all over Malaysia, and then we had them validated against the original material to, to, to prove that no loss in performance. In 2012, we produced our first passenger car tire, test tire. Now here, this is a Malaysian invention. Now we have a long way to go. There's a lot more to be done. But I can tell you right now, we have broken the back of the problem. Sustainable rubber recycling is possible. There is absolutely no reason that the one billion tires, the 300, or about three billion plus tires that are already in landfills around the world, there's absolutely no reason why they need to be burnt or put into landfills. They can go back into value-added manufacturing. The first tires that we made have changed everything. So. The message I leave you with is now ask questions. Make sure that sustainability is the way to go where tires are concerned the next time you're going to change your tires. Thank you very much.